a warm welcome to the Latin American Library and to the public opening of the recently acquired Rafael Emilgar Collection, an event that we are co-hosting with the Center for Inter-American Research and Policy. And I want to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. First and foremost, I want to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Javier Garcia Diego, noted Mexican historian and president of El Colegio de México, eh, who accepted our invitation to provide some historical contours of um, the extraordinary period of Mexican history in which General Rafael Emelgar lived. Um, Professor Garcia Diego will speak on uh, Rafael Melgar and 20th century Mexican history. And my colleague Ludovico Feoli uh, will introduce our speaker in a few minutes. I also want to welcome several generations of the Melgar family who have also traveled from Mexico to be with us today. They are Licenciado Daniel Melgar, son of General Rafael Emelgar and his wife, Doña Carmen Alicia Cordero de Melgar, Licenciada Luz Maria Melgar, granddaughter of General Melgar, and the great-grandchildren, Axel Ternitsky and Juan Jose Aguilar. I am so glad that you can be with us today uh, to mark this special occasion. And Licenciado Melgar will offer some biographical comments on his father, after Dr. Garcia Diego's talk. But before moving on with our program, I want to say a few words on the context of the general Rafael Melgar collection and what it means to our libraries. And, you know, a great research collection is not about the numbers of books or the numbers of manuscripts that it contains. It's not about one or two particular items or treasures either that it has. Rather, collections are more like mosaics where each piece of the individual pieces together form a larger picture of a geographical region or of a historical period or of an event or of a person. And the greatness of a library has more to do with how the various collections and documents and books, how they interrelate to each other, or how they speak to each other, and how the different pieces collected over time complement each other and form a network that documents human life. And this is why I'm absolutely thrilled with the acquisition of the Melgar Collection. It complements the holdings of the Latin American Library um, on many levels. Although today the library is broad in regional scope and historical depth, covering all of Latin America and the Caribbean, um, the Latin American Library has a long-standing and kind of special connection with the southern states of Mexico. And this is one of the focuses of the Melgar collection. A native of Oaxaca, General Melgar was as active on the national as on the regional stage and thus, the Melgar collection is rich in primary sources on these states. Beginning in 1913, when Melgar served as a soldier uh, in the state of Oaxaca, he then served as a five-term congressman and later a senator for the state of Oaxaca. He was campaign director for the Yucatan during Lázaro Cárdenas' successful run for the presidency and later served as governor of the territory of Quintana Roo, also under Cárdenas. The Melgar collection is complemented by what is arguably, I like to think, is the strongest collection perhaps in the world on the southern states of Mexico. The collection with which our library was founded, the William Gates collection, acquired in 1924, is well recognized as a very rich collection in um, native indigenous languages, especially Mayan languages. Um, but William Gates, the eccentric collector, as we were speaking about this afternoon, also amassed a wealth of newspapers and broadsides and other printed ephemera about the Mexican Revolution, some of which are displayed, and I'll tell you in a moment, and he also, in the process, inserted himself in the thick of Mexican politics of the time. 
I could also mention in this regard um, the Chiapas and the Vice Regal collections, the Rudolf Schuller collection of photographs of the Mexican Revolution. And casting the net more broadly to encompass the region, there are many, many collections um, that um, deal with the southern states of Mexico. Um, I could go on and name all of these collections, but better yet, I would like to invite all of you to look at our exhibit after the program today, um, because we have exhibited um, in various places collections from the Latin American Library that complement the Melgar collection. And last, but definitely not least, I wanted to acknowledge the work of several people who made this event possible. I want to thank Ludovico Feoli and the Center for Inter-American Policy and Research for co-hosting this event. And I also want to acknowledge the help of librarians Annie Peterson and Lisa Hooper for their contributions to this evening's event, this afternoon's event but especially the untiring efforts of the Latin American Library staff, Maria Dolores Espinosa, Emma Marshall, Rachel Robinson, Veronica Sanchez, and most especially Dr. Christine Hernandez, our curator of special collections, for their hard work in bringing about this event today. And so without further ado, here is Ludovico Feoli. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Hortensia, and um, I'd like to add uh, my thanks uh, to all of the personnel at the Latin American Library for their uh, hard work putting this collection together, and extend my own welcome to the Mencar family. It's so great to have you here. Um, and thank Hortensia for allowing me the opportunity to uh, co-sponsor this uh, wonderful event. Um, they, they must, everybody must run in the library when they see me cross the door, because I, I always mean work uh, in one form or another. Uh, but um, I uh, always bring visitors to Tulane first at, to the Latin American Library, because I think it's one of the jewels uh, that we have, one of the greatest resources for uh, Latin American studies. Um, but most of all, um, I'd like to um, extend uh, a welcome back uh, to our speaker today, Javier Garcia Diego, um, president uh, of the Colegio de Mexico, uh, with whom he just told me, um, is united with uh, Tulane in a long, long friendship. He might tell you something more about that, so I, I won't be a spoiler. Uh, um, but, uh, well, we had, uh, we co-hosted um, a conference on Mexico here uh, last year, a very, a very successful conference with scholars from the Colegio and, and, and Tulane. And uh, in his parting words, um, uh, per, uh, President Cowan and President Garcia Diego talked about the initiation of a friendship, but uh, then he discovered that in fact, uh, going back to the 40s, the early 40s, Tulane had given an honorary doctorate to the first president of the Colegio de Mexico. So uh, we're building, uh, we're as always, standing on the shoulders of the people who uh, came before us. Um, so, um, President Garcia Diego, um, as I said, um, is a professor and researcher um, at the Colegio de Mexico since 1981. He has served there as director of the Center for uh, Historical Studies at El Colegio um, and director general of the Instituto Nacional de Estudios Históricos de la Revolución Mexicana. Uh, Professor Garcia Diego uh, holds a bachelor's degree in political science from the uh, Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, UNAM, a master's degree in Latin American history from the University of Chicago, a PhD in Mexican history from El Colegio de México, and a second PhD in Latin American history from the University of Chicago. His field of specialization is the Mexican Revolution, particularly its political and cultural aspects in a timeline that stretches from the late 19th to the mid 20th century. His first doctoral dissertation was entitled, and loosely translated, uh, because I only found the title in Spanish, um, Constitutionalist Revolution and Counter-Revolution, Reactionary Movements in Mexico, 1914-1920. 
His second doctoral dissertation was the National University and the Mexican Revolution, 1910-1920. He has taught at the UNAM and the Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México, but has been most active as a professor at the Colegio de México. He has been a visiting professor and lecturer at university, universities worldwide. He has received numerous awards and recognitions, um, and I'll mention a few. The Salvador Azuela Award, uh, the Biografías para Leerse Contest, the Gran Cruz de la Orden de Isabel la Católica, a career recognition from the Instituto Nacional de Estudios Históricos de las Revoluciones de México, the prestigious Julio Cortázar Chair at the Universidad de Guadalajara, membership in the Sistema Nacional de Investigadores, and in the Academia Mexicana de la Historia, and two honorary doctorates, one from the Universidad Nacional de General San Martín in Argentina, and the other from the National University in Athens, Greece. He has authored many articles and books, um, and I won't list all of them. I'll say that his most recent one is an anthology of essays on the sociopolitical history of the Mexican Revolution, published uh, last year. Professor Garcia Diego is also the main speaker for uh, the weekly radio program, Conversaciones sobre Historia, broadcast nationwide by the Instituto Mexicano de la Radio. Incidentally, if, if you'd like to listen to them, they're, um, they're available on uh, the Colegio website as podcasts. Without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to give the podium then to uh, Javier Garcia Diego. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. First of all, I have to thank Lend University for this invitation. And second, uh, even though I made my PhD in Chicago, it was about 30 or 35 years ago, so my English has become very rusty. My pronunciation is terrible, but I'll do my best to explain uh, these two, two topics. First, the Mexican Revolution in general, and then Melgar uh, integration into the Mexican Revolution. For me, it really is an honor to speak here at the University, and especially in this in this area. So I really appreciate the invitation. Let me begin with a very broad uh, argument. The Mexican Revolution was a very complex social movement, and it was complex in sociological sociological terms. Uh, peasants were involved in the revolution. Also, of course, workers, not as much as peasants. Mexico was a rural country. Then middle classes, mainly rural middle classes, but also urban middle classes, and even some elites. For example, Madero. Madero was one of the was was a member of one of the richest family in the northeast part of Mexico. So yes, we had elites in the Mexican Revolution. Political, politically, it was also a complex because um, some, uh, especially in the first period of the Mexican Revolution, demanded democratic changes. I'm speaking, I'm talking, I'm thinking in Francisco y Madero. But then, after Madero's failure, from 1913 on, the political demand changed. And instead of democratic reforms, they demand, the revolutionaries demand, a strong state. I'm thinking in Carranza, in Obregón, Calles, and even Cárdenas, of course. Geographically, it was very complex. The Mexican Revolution began in the northern states, Sonora, Chihuahua, and Coahuila. We have at least one other region, Morelos, which is in the central part of Mexico, south central part of Mexico. But some other regions followed the revolution, but some others even opposed the revolution, rejected. And this is very important because Oaxaca was one of these states. And it's crucial to think it this way to understand uh, Melgar's uh, first years in the Mexican Revolution. Chronologically, the Mexican Revolution can be divided. When I'm talking about the Mexican Revolution now, in this, in this talk, 
uh, I will refer uh, until 1940. I'm talking about the first half of the 20th century, okay? Because <coughs> in the second part, we have another, another process. But in, in, in the first half of the, of the 20th century, we have uh, some periods in the Mexican Revolution. The first one, the purposory phase, uh, the crisis of the Porfiriato. We can, we can say that it lasts from 19, 1900 till 1910 more or less. Uh, then we have the military period, 1910-1920. The years of uh, more um, violence, the years of the caudillos, uh, in the elites or the middle middle classes we have Madero and Carranza, and in the, from the lower classes, from the rural classes, from the popular classes, we have Villa and Zapata. And of course at the end of that second phase, second period of the Mexican Revolution, we have the Constitution of 1917. Then we have the Reconstruction. From 1920 to 1933-34, what do we have in that second, second, third process of the Mexican Revolution? First of all, the end of social violence, with the exception, with the exception, of the, Cristiada, of the Cristiada Rebellion in the west part of Mexico from 1926 till 1929. I don't know if you're reading this uh, PowerPoint over there. Yes? Can you read it? Okay. So, we are talking about the end of the social violence with the exception of the Cristiada. What was the Cristiada? It was a religious, mainly religious uh, rebellion. This is the best example of a region that rejected the revolution. I mentioned Oaxaca earlier. This is probably the, the most important uh, example of a region that opposed the revolution. They were opposed to the new state, supposedly against Catholicism. Cristiana also had some other some other reasons, not only religious religious process, but let us say that. Then we have the assimilation of former rebels. Since we're talking of the end of social violence, we have to understand that the former revolutionaries uh, got integrated into the new state. We have uh, former revolutionaries that became peaceful people yeah, in the 1920s, coming from the revolutionary factor, uh, sectors people that uh, had fought with Villa, with Zapata, with Sevilla in San Luis Potosí. Please do not uh, mix it with the other Sevilla in the last part of the 20th century. But we also had the assimilation of uh, former rebels that had fought not with the revolution, but against the revolution. And this is the case of uh, Manuel Peláez, who fought Supposedly, he was paid by the oil companies, and he fought in the Gulf Coast of Mexico from 1914 to 1920. Also, we have the Felicistas. Felicistas means the followers of Felix Diaz, the nephew of Porfirio Diaz, who fought against the revolution in Veracruz, San Puebla, in the eastern, central eastern part of Mexico. Then we have Chiapas. Chiapas had two armies, one in the upper region of Chiapas, uh, and others in the lower sections of Chiapas, Los Mapaches, okay? and then we have Oaxaca. I underline Oaxaca because we're going to deal with Rafael Belgar, and he was born in Oaxaca. Oaxaca also uh, fought against the Mexican Revolution from, let us say, 1914 until 1920. Uh, basically, there were two rebel armies in Oaxaca, uh, one in the Mixteca, in La Montaña, and the other in La Sierra. What other features had the, the Mexican state, Mexican history in the Reconstruction period? The beginning of social benefits. In order to integrate former Vistas, excuse me, 
former vitistas and former zapatistas to the new state, you have to offer them social concessions, social benefits. So we had the beginning of a grand reform in the 1920s, and we had also the beginning of uh, concessions to the workers. There was no way to get peace in Mexico to integrate these former revolutionaries without social concessions. This is you know, really a, a stepping stone in, in, to understand Mexico's modern, modern history. Strongholds in some regions and among certain sectors. What I'm trying to say is that even though we were constructed a new state, there were some aspects really strong, uh, difficult to, to manage, and especially I'm thinking in the military. The military were a sector, you know, difficult to manage, at least until 1927-26. Another feature of Mexico in the 20s and early 30s, uh, we call it Politica Bronca. I don't know the translation, but uh, rude politics or brutal politics, something like that. We had pre-electoral rebellions in 1920, 1924, and 1929. What do I mean by pre-electoral rebellions? There were no rebellions because of the outcome of the election. There were rebellions because of the decision of who was the man selected to become the, the candidate. In 1920, uh, De La Huerta, Obregón, and Calles revolt against uh, Venustiano Carranza because he was he had chosen Ignacio Bonillas as his successor. In 1924, uh, De La Huerta and other generals revolt against Obregón because he had been, he had selected Calles as his for, as his successor. And in 1928. We got something very special. Just I, I will mention just uh, just to see how bronca, how good was uh, Mexican politics in, in those days. The three candidates to the presidency were killed within eight months. I'm talking of uh, uh, General Serrano, who was uh, killed yes in October, early October of 1927, and then. Two months later, uh, Arnold Ferre Gomez, uh, he was uh, fusilado, he was, uh, what would I say, fusilado, <laughs> executed, <laughs> yes. And then we had uh, Obregón, who was already elected president, who had been killed by a radical Catholic. Uh, his name was Don Torral. Uh, What did the political do to solve this political problem? In order to resolve these problems, they create the PNR in early 1929. The PNR, we call it the grandfather of the Greek. I don't like that name. I, I think really that there were three different parties, PNR in 29, PRM in 38, and then PRI in 1946. Uh, I don't really, I, I really don't see that they were the same party. I see three different parties, or at least three different processes in Mexican history. But the PNR in 1929 was created to solve these problems, the, the electoral rebellions, just to give you know discipline, rules to the to the revolutionary elite in order that they accept the successor uh, elected or not elected, chosen by, by the former president. So they created the PNR and Rafael Magat was involved in this process. Also, in order to finish with the Politica Bronca, we had uh, very important reforms inside the army you know, to professionalize to institutionalize the army. It was very important, and it was done in the same years, 1929, 1928, you know, just, just to have a more modern country. And of course, we had the beginning of an economic growth after 
10 years of violence, at least we could uh, invest in economic aspects, railroads, ports, factories, whatever, instead, instead of sending the money to the army. That was very important change in the, in the 20s. The next process, the next phase of the Mexican Revolution was the Cardenas years, 1934 until 1920. Uh, I understand, I tried to explain the Cardenas presidency as an offspring of the 1929 crisis. That's my explanation, it's not only mine, some other historians do the same. Uh, after the 1929 crisis, there began in Mexico social crisis, a lot of uh, protest, strikes uh, in the rural sector of the country, of course, in the, in the industry. So the Mexican political elite decided that Mexico had to respond to this social consequence, social offspring of the economic crisis of 1929. So the Cardenas presidency can be seen in this way. Second feature of the Cardenas presidency was the nationalism. Nationalism has two aspects, and we're going to see it again with a with, with Melgar uh, biography. Nationalism flourished during the Cardenas presidency because some politicians in Mexico and some social social leaders understood, or at least they thought, that the great powers had a great responsibility in the 1929 crisis. So they were thinking in Mexico as an alternative, uh, a country that should have a future, a future without, without being, being linked to the great power. In order to survive, these young and weak nations had to find an alternative. And Cardenas' ideology is something like this. Uh, of course, in order to, to understand this presidency, we have to see that Cardenas gave more social concessions than his predecessors, than the previous presidents of the country. <coughs> Let's move to the last period, uh, the fifth uh, phase of the Mexican Revolution, what we call institutionalization. From the 1940 till 1970s, probably, then began the period of the, of the crisis. Um, what I say here is that due to World War II, and due especially to World War, Mexico had to align itself to the United States. It's easy to understand, right? So the Cardenas ideology had to, to put on, had to finish. So Mexico uh, really moved, changed its, its uh, main features, and we have a country much more moderate in terms of social reforms. The, the ideology of a radical and a very popular country uh, also uh, moderate itself. We have an institutionalization of the political throne. What do I mean by institutionalization? We had a formal democracy. We had oppositionist parties. The PAN, the PAN, was formed, was created in 1939. The left party, the Partido Popular, was created in 1948. Uh, we had other institutions besides the strong president, as Calles, Obregón, and Cárdenas. We had Congress, we had Cámara de Senadores, Cámara de Diputados, and of course, in order to institutionalize political, the political struggle, uh, the, the great caudillos had to be uh, had to vanish. Uh, Calles was exiled. Cárdenas was in Mexico, but in, in a very low, low position. Sevillo was killed. Almazan was in the opposition. Garrido Canaval was also exiled. Mexico really. What other features we have in, 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 in the 1940s economic development, in a way due to World War II? 
we have a, a modern country. Mexico became urban, industrialized, integrated. And just to finish with this, with this part of the talk, uh, we had from the 1950s and 1960s an acceptable revolution. What do I mean by that? A non-radical revolution in comparison to Cuba's. So since Cuba emerged in the, in the late 1950s and early 60s, the Mexican Revolution became as the good one, the moderate, the reasonable revolution, a revolution capable of creating a modern country. So this is uh, what I see in the first half of the 20th century. I have two maps here. Yes. This map comes from, a, from one of my books. What you see here is the revolution of 1913-1914 against Victoriano Huerta. As I was saying, Mexican Revolution was a northern social movement. We have the revolution in the northwest, Obregón, revolution in the central north, Pancho Villa, and revolution in the northeast, Venustiano Carranza. The revolution was not a, nas a national movement. We don't see, beside Morelos Zapatista in the central part of Mexico, but in the south and southeast, we don't see important uh, battles. We don't see important armies. Oaxaca, here, we cannot see it as a revolutionary state. These are the armies that fought against the Carranza regime. We have some that were revolutionaries before. The Villistas, the Sedigistas, and of course the Zapatistas in this. But we have here number seven Soberanistas in Oaxaca. Then, then the, 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 the Oaxacas, the Oaxaca state did participate. Not in the previous years, not in the fought against Huerta, but yes, in the fought against uh, in the fought against Car Carranza, Carranza presidents. Let's move now to <coughs> Rafael Meridano. What was Melgar in, in the Mexican Revolution? But most important, what was Melgar in the first half of the 20th century? And mainly from the years 1920 until his death in the late 1950s. As I was saying, Melgar was born in the state of Oaxaca during the Porfirian era, during the Porfirian era. Okay? Oaxaca was a non-revolutionary region dominated by a network of Porfirian local authorities. Uh, easy to understand. Uh, Oaxaca is the state where uh, Porfirio Diaz had been born in, uh, in 1830. So most of the local authorities in Oaxaca by 1910 were loyal to Porfirio Diaz and they remained loyal during the revolution of 1910-1911 and then rejected uh, the triumph of Carranza from 1914 until 1920. Miguel was a very prominent member of this army, the Soberanista Army or the Soberanista Faction. Yeah. But the Soberanista Faction yes, was one of the factions that was integrated to the new Mexican Revolutionary State in 1920. So, the God benefited a lot from this transformation. For me, this is the first crucial shift in his life. He was, as I was saying, part of this social, military, and political movement, the Sovereignista faction, and then he was integrated in 1920 when Melgar and the other members of the Sovereignista factions recognized Obregón. In order 
to get peace in Mexico, Obregón understood that had to integrate former revolutionaries that were f fighting against Carranza, Villistas and Zapatistas, but also all the other groups that were fighting well, that, that, that were fighting in the country for different regions, for different reasons. And this is why the Oaxacans were integrated in 1920. Then in 1924, Melgar made another very important shift. He abandoned the army, he quit the army, because he had been integrated in 1920, and became a full-time civil politician. Okay? Not military, civil politician. And then I think he discovered his real vocation, his, his, his nature. And he became really a very important uh, politician, not only in Oaxaca, but mainly in national terms. He was uh, in, the, in the foundation of the PNR in 1929, and then we can say that he became part of the Mexican political elite. Another very important feature in his life is that in 1929, yes, when he was member of the elite that created the PNR, the party created by Plutarco Yascaris, he also organized in that same year the Campaña Nacionalista. The Campaña Nacionalista was an answer to the crisis, to the economic crisis of October and of 2019. But it, it was not only that. It was much more than an economic response to the crisis. Yes, the main topic of the Campaña Nacionalista was to consume what Mexico produces. But it has something else. Um, The Mexican Revolution had produced a new culture. Mexican muralism, Mexican music, new literature, many, many things. So the Campaña Nacionalista is linked also to this, to this new culture. And this is one of the reasons the Campaña Nacionalista also promotes Mexican features like, like Chavarilla. But I really underline that you have to understand this Campaña Nacionalista in, in the scope of the new culture that had been produced, that had been created with the Mexican Revolution in general. Uh, besides, what I say here is that La Campaña Nacionalista was also very timely because it, uh, it was parallel to the birth of uh, modern cinema. In 1929, it began the El Cine Hablado, El Se Acababa El Cine Mudo, and of course, we have the radio broadcasting. So it was, uh, it's, it, it, it's another aspect of the modernization of the country. And we have really to underline the importance of Melgar in this, in this aspect of Mexican history. Well, his nationalist attitude explains the identification and the support to President de Cárdenas. So what we have to say here is that he was one of the many politicians in Mexico that abandoned Calles and then moved to Cárdenas. It was not only a, a personal aspect. No, the problem is that for the reason was that these politicians understood that the future of the country, the, the well-being of the country, was linked to Cárdenas, was a better response to the crisis and to the new international context that the one that was thought by Plutarco Gascalles, who was much more conservative in social, political, and international terms. With the presidency of, of, uh, of Cárdenas, Melgar was sent as governor to a, I, I cannot say, state of Quintana Roo, because it was not a state. It was a federal, uh, a, a federal territory. Didn't have enough population, so it wasn't a state. But it was very important because Cárdenas had a governor in, 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 in Yucatán, of course, 
and he made a lot of changes, a lot of political and, and social changes. A very important agrarian reform in Yucatan uh, was sponsored by, the, by, by Cárdenas against, los, against the Enequeneras, Enequeneras, Enequeneras. But in order to, to help the reforms in Yucatan, Melgar was sent to, to Quintana Roo. There were two problems in Quintana Roo. First, to organize from the state, not, not, not inside, not an autogenous uh, organization. Organization from without, organization from above, from the state, uh, to organize the Chiclero workers, the Maya Indians, and to oppose the frontier with Belize or Honduras Britannica, as we want to say it. So it was very important to have a very nationalistic governor in the region of Quintana Roo. Uh, the other interpretation is or possible way to see it is that Melgar was linked to Calles. Remember, he was one of the founders of the PNR. So probably Cardenas wanted to have him and to have him away. I do choose the previous interpretation, the first one. I think Cardenas wanted a real nationalistic and important uh, governor in Quintana Roo. President Cardenas ended his term in 1940. And uh, after President Cardenas, we had Avila Camacho and an, an Alemán. Melgar was known as a Cardenista. And Mexico had to do some changes uh, for the 40s. Remember that we were talking about uh, the, the decade of the violence, 1910-1920, the reconstruction, 1920-1934, the radical years of Cardenas, and then we, we were talking about the institutionalization after 1940. Uh, with Avila Camacho and Alemán, yeah. Mexico made, made another great move. Uh, I, as I was saying, due to the outcome of the Second World War, uh, the Cardenismo was no longer uh, the best way to solve the problems of the country and to solve the problems of the international aspect of Mexico's, Mexico's economy. So, the, the Cardenismo in general became an oddity in Mexican politics. Nationalism was replaced by Pan Americanism. Okay. It was a response to the Second World War and it was a response to the Cold War. And Mexico became, of course, an ally of the United States and even an ally of Great Britain, in spite of the fact that we had expropriated oil in 1938. In the 1940s, as a Cardenista, you know, Melgar had no longer really a good place in Mexico. So then he was sent as diplomat to some other countries and then returned to Mexico in the 1950s. Of course, was elected again as representative of Oaxaca, but he was no longer, you know, a part of the Mexican political elite because Avila Camacho and principal. Alemán had basic and strong differences with uh, Lázaro Cárdenas as president. Besides, uh, Melgar, I don't say that he was old, but uh, Mexico's, uh, let's say, el promedio de edad <coughs> in those years was around 50. He was past middle age, and especially politics uh, has been dominated by university graduates, university alumni since the years of Alemán. So, since 1950, those former revolutionaries, the former cardenistas, the former callistas and obregonistas, uh, had no place for the new state that began in the second part of the 20th century Mexico. That's the way I see uh, the history of Mexico in those years. And that's the way I see the Melgar integration into our history. It's great to have its archive here, and I really appreciate 
is patient and obvious. Thank you very much. Thank you for that presentation. And now we have Licenciado Daniel Melgar, who will say a few words uh, on General Rafael Melgar, his father. Good afternoon. This might be a little more than a few words. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I want to express my sincere gratefulness to the University of Tulane. I'm sorry that uh, Dr. Michael Bernstein, Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost of this prestigious university, is not with us today. But I want to thank our very good friend, Dr. Hortensia Calvo, General Director of the Latin American Library, who became very much interested in the contents of my father's documents when she heard about it. And to Dr. Ludovico Peoli, Director of the Center of Inter-American Policy and Research, the host of this so important event for me. I also thank uh, Dr. Javier Garcia Diego for his thoughts about the participation of my father in the Mexican Revolution and the post-revolutionary years, although I don't agree completely with him. <laughs> To talk about my father's public life would not be impartial on my part, but I think I must mention some of his actions from 1913, when he was elected cap captain by the people of his hometown and other towns of the mystic zone in the state of Oaxaca, in order to fight Governor Bolaños Cacho, who recognized the traitor Victoriano Huerta, until the last deeds of my father as senator in 1958. The contents of the General Rafael Melgar collection are here now, as I understand, to serve as a source for students, researchers, historians, and scholars interested in the period of 45 years of Mexican history in which he participated very actively, first in the revolution, then 10 years as federal congressman, six as governor of the ter territory of Quintana Roo, three and a half years as extraordinary envoy and plenipotentiary minister of Mexico at Queens Wilhelmina and Juliana's courts in Holland, and six years as senator representing the state of Oaxaca. At the end of his participation in the revolution, since the state of Oaxaca declared itself a sovereign state until the constitutional order was restored, all Oaxacan generals were declared outlaws. With the death penalty on site, my father came to, it, to the United States in exile, where he worked in a hardware company in St. Louis, Missouri. There, due to his dedication, he became manager of the Latin American division. He also learned English, which helped him very much in his years in Mexico's diplomatic service. I must make some uh, more words about this period. The period in which the uh, Oaxaca state declared its sovereignty, it's important. It has not been thoroughly studied and uh, it I cannot agree with uh, Dr. Garcia Diego that the generals of this movement in Oaxaca opposed the revolution. They went into the revolution. I had the honor of meeting some of the generals, especially General Guillermo Mecuero, who was the governor of the state of Oaxaca in this period, the secretary, the attorney at law, and General Onesimo Gonzalez. One of the division generals, equivalent to a four star general of the states, General Isaac Ibarra from the Sierra of Juarez, and others. Uh, even I met uh, 
General Almazan, who later betrayed the system, the political system of Mexico, running against uh, the candidate of the Revolutionary Party against Cardinal, against Avila Camacho. I remember my father telling me why. Why did the revolutionary generals and government of Oaxaca became sovereign again. The biggest problem was many defectors, groups of defectors from Pancho Villa, for instance, or even from Carranza, invaded towns of the mist, high mystic area and uh, assaulted towns, small towns, burned towns, robbed the people. Uh, raped the wind. So uh, the forces of, of Oaxaca, including my father, of course, who was in that area, had to fight against this group. That's why it's mentioned here that the sovereign state was declared until the constitution order was restored. Furthermore, in the isthmus of the Wetebeck, that's the southern part of Oaxaca, the brother of Venustiano uh, Carranza was murdered. That had, had nothing to do with the sovereignty of Oaxaca or the generals of Oaxaca that were fighting in the revolution. They did not oppose the revolution. What happened is that Venustiano Carranza sort of uh, have them as responsible for the killing of his brother. They had nothing to do with that. So um, he sent forces to Oaxaca and General Jesus Agustin Castro, and uh, he declared, in the name of Carranza, outlaw all the generals. They continued fighting, of course, not against the revolution, but against Venustiano Carranza. What happened is that they they didn't have good armament, ammunition. I remember him telling me how he could uh, get 300 prisoners of uh, a group of Pancho Villa's forces. And, and he was so happy then because they really had good armament from the states and lots of ammunition. And he even invited some of them to join his forces. This period has to be really studied. I cannot agree that the generals of Oaxaca, including my father, opposed the revolution on the country. They raised their arms against uh, the trade of the Toledo world. If we believe or if we agree that the Mexican Oaxacan generals opposed the revolution, we have to agree also that the generals from Sonora, including Obregón, Calles, also opposed the revolution. They did not oppose the revolution, they opposed the Nusera Carranza. I might even say that the Nusera Carranza was linked to the Porfiriato in some way. But I'm sorry, but I had to make uh, an idea about this. After that, after the exile, when the plan of Agua Prieta uh, was given to the nation, the generals from Oaxaca and others had to go back, went to go back and went back to Mexico. I don't agree, Dr. Garza Diego, that he didn't see any future in the Mexican army. We must understand that there are two kinds of military in Mexico in this stage. The revolutionary people, like my father, who started being 
elected by the small towns, by the people of the small towns, against the governor. And the army, formal army that existed, which was a federal army, an army base with, uh, with career people, people that studied in the military college and force armies that were organized under General Amaro. Right? So he, he, he didn't expect to make a military career at all. He was not a military, actually. He had to be because of the revolution. Only. So his, uh, his um, raid as a brigade general was recognized. And then he immediately requested the license to become candidate as a federal congressman from Oaxaca. He already had been a congressman during the revolution for in the state of Oaxaca, but also he requested the license to continue fighting the revolution. During his 10 years in the House of Representatives, he participated in many important political roles, not only in key laws such as the labor and monetary ones, but in fundamental decisions that, in my view, are the most important for the political, economic, and social developments of Mexico. One of my father's most significant initiatives, as Dr. Asiarrivo uh, told us months ago, was the Campaña Nacionalista, the Nationalist Campaign. His idea was to ease the consequences of, in Mexico of the Wall Street crack of 1929. So well known and expressed by Dr. Bernstein in his study, the Great Depression, the late recovery, and economic change in America in 1929-1930. The initiative was unanimously accepted by Congress, and Congress Melga was appointed as president of the campaign. As such, he called all industrial and commercial chambers, whether federal or regional, to support and participate in it under the motto, consume lo que el país produce, consume what the country produces. This motto was later used many years by Pemex, our national petroleum company. He called the Mexicans to buy only Mexican products during one week every month. This campaign succeeded and lasted from 1931 to 1935. General Melgar published his nationalist calendar from 1932 to 1935, of which one copy is available in the collection here. Not a cent of government funds was spent for the campaign. All expenses were made by the mentioned chambers. In this library, two books dedicated to this campaign published in 1953 and 1964 can be consulted. It is important to mention my father's relationship with General Lázaro Cárdenas de Perigo, not only as a friend, but in his very important actions as president of the National Revolutionary Bloc of Congress, to organize members of the House and Senate to support the candidacy of General Cárdenas to the presidency of the country, and sign a manifest for that purpose which was published in all newspapers, some of the regions of which are included in this collection. I may uh, also say that the meetings for this purpose were at my home. And, uh, after the manifest was signed by congressmen and senators, and of course, my father was uh, appointed there as uh, president of the Cardinalista bloc of Congress. At midnight, General Calles called my father and told him, General, I have heard what you are doing. You have to stop this. 
My father answered, you know, it's all in the newspaper. What happened later is that, you know, Cayes had to support communists. Why did my father this, did that? We, we must remember that my father named Cayes Jefe Máximo de la Revolución. In spite of that, when uh, General Cayes wanted to impose to impose General Pérez Treviño as a candidate for president, my father's group, political group, could not accept it. And of course, he had the relation, political and friendly, friendly relation with uh, General Cárdenas. As we know now, General Cárdenas became the best president of Mexico in the 20th century. From 1935 to 1940, as governor of the then territory of Quintana Roo, my father gave the best years of his life to redeem such abandoned region of Mexico, which is now the most important for tourism. He organized its economy by establishing production and consumption cooperatives, thus avoiding monopolies that existed in almost every activity. Under the agrarian reform, whose main executor was President Cárdenas, Governor Melgar expropriated two very large latifundios, huge extensions of land which were owned by the Bank of London and Mexico or the National Bank of Mexico, and distribute, distributed such land among Mayan peasants who had been exploited under inhuman conditions with very low wages and who, by the coopera cooperatives for them organized could negotiate directly with the buyers of chicle in Chicago, the chewing gum manufacturers. They got much better prices for the production. Governor Melgar also renamed towns which bore the names of saints or British people with the names of natural heroes for Quintana Roo to become more nationalist and more of a part of Mexico. My father also built schools, markets, government offices, roads, the first food hotels in Chetumal, Cozumel, and Tulum Ruins. All these buildings still exist. And his government and deeds received a public recognition by the Senate of Mexico, something that, to my knowledge, no other governor ever received in Mexico. Even in this century, 70 years after his governorship ended, Avenues, streets, schools, cultural buildings, statues, of course, bear his, his name. And I must say that I can, I can go back anytime to Quintana Roo with the pride of the recognition of everything he worked for in the territory now state, and with the pride of being able to say that when my family left Quintana Roo, none of us had one single square meter or any other property. I have to clarify again, Dr. Casadiego, why my father was sent to Quintana. It's not because he was considered a callista. That is the case we have to consider callistas, everybody in that area, our politicians. My father named him Jefe Mexico, Maximo of the Revolution, because he, he really was. He was the power behind President Ortiz Rubio, Ortiz Hill, of course, and Abelardo Rodriguez, three presidents. And he actually governed politically the Republic of Mexico. My first uh, father's house was only half a block away from the house of General Carlin. And he told me that some case, sometimes, uh, since my father was the leader of the Congress, of the House of Representatives, at 7.30 in the morning, General Carlin would call him and say, 
General, please come to my home. My father dressed immediately and went to see General Cayo. And he said, well, I'm, I'm here. What can I do for you? And General Cayo would say, in this occasion, Governor, Governor so-and-so, I don't remember the name, is against our party. So I asked you to, in Congress, to, uh, how do you say it in English? This, this conocer. I, I, I don't know the context. This conocer. Si, this conocer to, I know it. I How need the we, context. Well, to, 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 to take out such governor. Oh. And my father said, okay, we will we, we'll do it. Who do you want to be the new governor? And the other guy said, that's up to you. This kind of power had in my <coughs> But when my father convinced United congressmen and senators, including ones from Sonora, to manifest and declare General Cárdenas as a candidate. General Cárdenas had to accept it. And the next day, he also made some declarations to the press. My father was, as I pointed out, declared president of the Cardenalista block of Congress. It's in the newspapers in the collection here. That he was a good friend of Cardinal. So he wasn't sent there because he was a Callista. What happened is that since my father made that nationalist campaign, which was very important for Mexico, and since he knew all presidents or main executives of all the commercial or industrial chambers. And he led uh, the first uh, organizations to, to visit Costa Rica and Guatemala with these chambers. General Cardenas told him, you will be the next Minister of Economy. On December 1st, 1934, my father told me he was getting dressed to go to a ceremony where General Cardenas would take uh, power. On radio, they used to give the news of the new cabinet. So he heard the new cabinet and his name was not there. So he stopped dressing and he rest at home. The next day, three senators came to see him and said, uh, President Cardenas asked for you what he wants to see you. He said, I have nothing to, to visit Mr. Cardenas for. I don't go. But one of the senators told him, well, you are a general, and the president of Mexico is the chief of all the military. You have to go. So he asked for an appointment and he was his own president Cardenas in the National Palace. When he arrived to see uh, the president, the president told him, well, General, I want you to help me becoming governor of the territory of Quintana. My father answered, Señor Presidente, no me equivoqué. I didn't make a mistake. And the president told him, well, please understand that I have many problems with General Calles. I had to include some of his people in the cabinet. But this cabinet, I will change. Then I'll call you back. Six, eight months. And my father said, it's an order. I have to go. I go. Then he went to Quintana Roo. 
and uh, from uh, Merida, Yucatan. My mule, he went to the Maya zone to see the people of Cecilio Chi, who had been in war, the war of castas. And from there, of course, to the capital city, which name was Palio Obispo then. And after he was there a few months, <coughs> he saw what he could do. And he saw that he could do great things for these people and for the territory. So he stayed there. We went with him when I was three years old. And uh, we stayed there six years. I'm sorry, I've taken much of the time. In 1944, 45, he was appointed by President Tabela Camacho. He was invited to join the diplomatic service with a choice between the embassy in Holland or delegation in the Hague Holland. And thinking of my elder brother and myself, he chose Holland so that we could learn languages. Besides his diplomatic work, he started negotiations for Femex tankers to start supplying oil to Rotterdam for European customers, and also he spent his free time studying cooperative systems, especially those of Sweden and Denmark. Later, he wrote many articles about cooperative systems and international politics, which were published during 11 years in El Universal newspaper. In 49, upon his return to Mexico, he immediately contacted his personal political friends to start working on the next campaign for the presidency of Mexico. In 1951, he founded and presided the Alianza Nacional de Agrupaciones Revolucionarias, which was the first political organization to launch the candidacy of Adolfo Ruiz Cortines, who he had known for many years since Ruiz Cortines was the congressman. Ruiz Cortines won the election. General Melgar was elected as senator for the state of Oaxaca in 1952. Besides his participation in important issues such as the vote for women, he presented the initiative to establish the Belisario Dominguez Medal for citizens who participated in political, social, cultural, or professional actions for the good of Mexico, which is still granted by the Senate and presented by the President every year. General Rafael Mega passed away on March 21st, 1959. He was my father, my professor, my counselor, and of course, my best friend. As a father, he was strict, but very warm and loving. As a human being, he was kind, humble, always punctual, a hard worker, and especially caring always for the poorest towns and people of his estate at Quintana. I thank you all very much for your time and your pay presence and patience in this ceremony, as I mentioned before, so important for me and my family. Thank you very much.